Franco Nevada is the world's largest and most diversified gold streaming and royalty company. Joining me now to uh, discuss the inner workings of the firm and uh, gold in general uh, and the sector itself, we're joined by Paul Brink, the CEO of Franco Nevada Corporation. Good to see you, Paul. And yourself, Mark. Now, uh, you've said before that uh, because of Franco's model, you think that, uh, and you know that, and the numbers bear it out, that uh, you're not that in, in impacted by, by cost inflation. So uh, I explain the streaming royalty model from a high level and, and explain how you are uh, insulated compared to the inflation we're seeing for mining operators, for example. Well, we're so fortunate in the business that we have. Most of our holdings are either royalties or streams. Slightly different. Royalties are just a top line interest in a property. So one or two percent of the gold produced so not impacted by cost inflation. Streams are slightly different in the structure. Often in a stream, we, we do pay an ongoing cost as each ounce gets delivered, but that cost is either a fixed cost or it's a percentage of the spot gold price. Uh, so in either case, it's not subject to operating cost inflation. Uh, so our business largely is insulated against that inflation. In fact, part of our business is we hold oil and gas royalties. As you know, energy is obviously a big portion of what's driving global cost inflation. Uh, so we actually have uh, positive leverage to the forces that are causing industry inflation. And you had record oil and gas numbers in Q2, correct? Uh, yeah, that sector has been doing tremendously well. Oil price is very strong, but in particular, we had in the last couple of years did two gas deals. We were assuming 250, 275 natural gas prices, uh, and today they eight or nine dollars, so doing tremendously well. Right. Now, in terms of your assets, at, at last report, you've got 413. 113 uh, of those are in production, 43 at an advanced stage, and 257 uh, exploration assets. So at first glance to some people, they may think, my, my God, that's so unwieldy. How do you manage all that? You obviously know how to do that. Um, so what are the main benefits and advantages to, to, to all of that diversification? Well, first up, because we don't operate any assets, we can build a much more diversified portfolio than you can as an operating company. Uh, but there is the broad distinctions in what we hold, uh, both the royalties and the streams. The, the big, all our big streams are precious metal byproduct streams on, on big copper mines. So those are assets that have 30, 50 year mine lives. We also have royalties on, on some of the world's best iron ore assets. Again, they'll run 50, 70 years. Uh, in addition to that, you've got the royalty side of the business where we got, as you point out, many royalties on gold properties. They tend to be shorter lived, but arguably have greater optionality because if you do find more, it can be a multiple of what you expected. Uh, so I think that combination of the stable, long dated streams where we know we're gonna be in business in 50, 70 years time, plus those gold and, and the energy royalties that give us that optionality, I, I think that's a fantastic business combination. Speaking of fantastic, uh, Franco Nevada's performance since the IPO in 2007 has really been outperforming. Uh, compound annual growth rate of 17% since then, that outperforms the S&P 500, the NASDAQ, gold itself, and so on. So I'm curious, uh, back to those assets, how do you uh, find optimal balance as you run this company between those producing assets, but making sure you've got the newer projects coming on stream to, to keep that growth going? The first thing in terms of growth is we believe this is a cyclical industry. Uh, so you, you can never predetermine what your rate of growth is going to be. Uh, you have to be patient. You've got to wait for the good assets to come to market. You've got to wait for the good entry points. Uh, that's part of the reason why we have some commodity diversification in our portfolio. It allows us to, to pick the points and be the most opportunistic. Uh, and over time, what we found is that, yes, that good blend of, of operating assets you know, plus assets on the come um, that'll deliver growth in the future has, has served us well. Your growth really seemed to ramp up in 2019 and, and through the, the subsequent years. Was that because Franco hit a, an inflection point of some sort or because new projects like, or newer projects like Cobra Panama were contributing more? I think you hit the nail on the head. Our biggest asset is Cobra Panama. We helped fund the build of that. It was uh, more than a $6 billion build. We were 1.35 billion into that. It started producing 2019. And so really has driven our growth of the last number of years as it's ramped up to full capacity. 
Uh, it'll also drive our growth over the next couple of years. It currently runs at 85 million ton per annum. First Quantum, who's done a fantastic job in building it and operating it, uh, are now expanding it up to 100 million ton per annum. Uh, and that should be completed through the end of next year. Now, uh, Paul, you're sitting on nearly $2 billion in available cash. And uh, you've said you like to be opportunistic and you hinted at it there in down cycle. So we've got gold at a two and a half year low. Are you finding more opportunities? And is this latest deal worth about 350 million in Mexico? Uh, uh, Tokenzino, is that how you, how you pronounce it? Yep. Is that part of that? Uh, yeah, well, first off, if, if you'd asked me the question 12 months ago, if it's a good time to invest, we all would have said the world is awash in cash. Um, not the best time to put a lot of capital to work. Things have changed quite quickly, and since its peak, uh, I think it's interesting that global equity and debt markets combined have lost $50 trillion worth in value. Uh, so things are tightening up, mm -hmm. and uh, I do think it's a good time. I, I think it's time for us to be more aggressive spending our capital. You know, arguably gold has not performed well, so it's it's the right commodity to be focusing on right now. Toca de Zinho is, is a good example of that. Uh, it's a good asset, about 2 million ounces, good grade, 1.3 gram per ton, simple open pit in Brazil. But as much as the asset, what we liked about that deal was the team. Uh, the G Mining Ventures team are one of the best proven mine building teams in the industry. They built us a can for Iron Gold a number of years ago. Uh, Marion for Newmont. Most recently, they built Fruta del Norte for Landine Gold. Uh, this is the first of the assets they plan to build in this company, but I think there'll be many more, and we look forward to a long relationship with the team. Am I right in saying the gentleman who runs G Mining is also on your board? So Louis Gignac is on our board. Uh, G, G Mining Ventures has been headed up by his two sons, uh, so they have followed their father's footsteps, uh, have been the engine behind G Mining Services, building many of those mines for last few years, but his sons have said that they now want to build mines for themselves rather than just for other people. Right. Interesting. Now, you said before that uh, you think gold is the anti-U.S. dollar. Uh, it's an alternative to, to debt and to stocks. But we know, as we mentioned, gold set a two and a half year low. U.S. dollar at multi-decade highs. Interest rates continue to go up. Are those the, just the two main factors in terms of a simple exp explanation as to why gold is uh, under underperforming? Yeah, gold trades on sentiment, uh, and the correlation, historically, there's a strong correlation uh, that gold trades in, in a different direction to the U.S. dollar compared with a basket of currencies. The U.S. dollar has, has outperformed here as the, as the U.S. economy has recovered faster than others, and that is the predominant investment play. Uh, but what underlies it is, is rates, and as, as the Fed is raising rates, so it makes treasuries more attractive, and hence the U.S. dollar versus the gold. Uh, so that's a that's a hard trend to fight, uh, but I think uh, as we get to the end of the rate raising cycle, uh, probably mid, maybe a bit later next year, uh, I think people then look back to say we've been through a, a phase of enormous inflation. Uh, I think gold as a hard asset will rebase, but I think the real question is uh, when we reach the peak of the rate raising, where does that leave us? Uh, if the U.S. economy is tipping into recession. If we still have inflation, I think then there's a chance gold goes on a real run. And in the meantime, uh, you'll be uh, harvesting assets potentially. Uh, <laughs> yes, you know we, we we have tremendous cash flow at the moment. We're generating a Q2 our EBITDA run rate annualized about 1.2 billion a year, and um, you know so that combined with our existing available capital uh, gives us a lot of money to put into growing the company. Now, back to Cobre Panama, you have said that in the future, copper will be a more meaningful part of, of, uh, of Franco Nevada. So, um, so is, is, that, is that primarily from, going to come from Cobre Panama? And also, secondarily, do you believe that the copper uh, has, will have a good run going out at least 10 years as a component of green energy build out and electric vehicles? We do in the portfolio have a number of longer dated uh, royalties on copper assets. Uh, probably first on the list is Alpala, big block cave uh, project in Ecuador, largest shareholders of BHP and, and Newcrest. Uh, next up is Taka Taka, a big copper porphyry system in Salta, Argentina, likely the next big copper mine that First Quantum builds. We have one on Copper World, which is the asset in the HUD base advancing in Arizona, one on Nueva Union, which is Tech and Newmont. I can go on and on. <laughs> uh, we've got interest on nickel properties, Crawford Nickel. Uh, 
So long dated exposure, we've got quite a bit to the low space metals. You know, and specifically agreed. I, I think it will do well here. It doesn't have as much leverage as say lithium or cobalt to the EV battery trend, uh, but they also have uh, technology risk, you know, both in terms of the application, but also the extraction. Uh, why we like copper is uh, there are such large, large deposits, uh, but also in its, its use, uses are so diversified that in the greater electrification trend, it's the surest winner. Lastly, Paul, with the Franco Nevada stock, uh, in April of this year, it hit an all-time high around 118 US, uh, sorry, 168 US, trading around 118 now. Um, so do you think of the stock right now, uh, is it being unfairly punished? Is it just down with a sector? Uh, is it just naturally consolidating after a big run like that? All of the above? <laughs> uh, our stock, because of our top line interests, our stock is a more defensive stock than most of the sector. And again, with this downturn, it's, that's proven to be the case as gold prices have come down. Uh, but what I think is, is not fully reflected in the value of the stock is the inflation protection that we have, as we discussed up front, uh, that, that others don't. Uh, I think as that's fully appreciated, it'll give some upside to the stock. Um, but more so, I think, you know, as we've spoken about looking forward to the Fed pivot, uh, once there's visibility on that, typically the markets look forward about six months. Uh, I think you'll see generalists returning to the gold sector. And for many of them, Franco is the go-to gold stock. All right, Paul, thanks for your time today and good luck with everything. We'll see you again. Thank you, Mark. Okay, Paul Brink, our thanks to him, the CEO of Franco Nevada. Thanks a lot for watching and we'll see you next time.